Hey guys, the Bank of England did something unusual today by keeping the base rate of interest at 5.25% against a lot of market participants, a lot of economists who had predicted that there might be a 0.25% increase uh, today. But the bank kept that base rate uh, at 5.25%, mainly driven because of uh, inflation. Inflation numbers had declined more than they had expected, or more than economists and other participants had expected, uh, in addition to other things that led them to actually keep those rates fixed. So today I want to just unpack what that means. Does it mean then that we're at the peak? The interest rates are now gonna start falling, we can all start relaxing and having some fun and partying. No, it doesn't mean that. I wanna just unpack what that means today by looking at the minutes of meetings. I wanna just speak to some of the things that jumped out to me as I read it line by line and just unpack what it might mean for us in our household and personal finances. If you're really enjoying today's video, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button to support our channel and the work that we do here. Now, looking at the minutes here, um, the vote was five to four, means that five people voted to keep that rate at 5.25% and four people actually wanted to increase it by 0.25%. That's a pretty close vote, telling you that this is not so clear cut. That's clue number one. It's not that we are now gonna to start to see rates coming down. It's that there is some you know, uncertainty there whereby five people decided to vote for a pause and four people believed that there was still evidence of persistent inflation, okay? Now, last time I had this update, six people voted for an increase and three people voted otherwise. So to, to see this proximity in the votes for five to four uh, should give us cause to really, really, you know, consider uh, our actions here going forward. Now, let's talk about the good news first of all, okay? Um, rates uh, have, obviously stayed the same. That means that people on variable rates are not gonna have an increase in their mortgages, which is excellent news for households because no one needs to go and find that extra 30 quid or whatever to pay because you know some guy decided that rates were gonna go up, right? So no one has to worry about that right now. But that doesn't mean that we don't have worries because a lot of households are gonna be coming out of fixed rates for the rest of this, uh, this year as well as into next year. So this remains a big, concern from a lot of people. The other big news was that inflation fell more than expected to 6.7%, with core inflation, core inflation being inflation that excludes food, energy, so all the volatile bits, alcohol, tobacco, core inflation ended up at 6.2% in the 12 months of August, 2023. Again, uh, this was down from 6, uh, down from 6.9% from the previous month in July again, defying the expectations of economists. Now, having read the bank's minutes, here are some things that jumped out to me. Let's look at UK GDP. So let's go to UK economy first, uh, with GDP obviously being uh, a metric for economic performance. Looking at that, I'm gonna read word for word. It says here, combining the signals from official, official data and the business surveys, which they send out, bank staff, get this, now expected GDP to rise by only 0.1% in Q3 of 2023, compared to 0.4% incorporated in the August numbers. Now, it says here that although some of this downside news could prove erratic, interesting choice of words, it says underlying growth was also likely to be weaker, okay? Or weaker than the quarter percent uh, quarter percent per quarter built into the August projections for the second half of 2023. In simple terms, uh, the expectations for, uh, for UK GDP, right, is not very good. And here's what it says. The clearest signs of weakness continue to be in the housing sector, with housing investment and most measures of house prices falling somewhat alongside a low level of property transactions, okay? So in short, basically, a lot of the indicators they look at for a measure of GDP are indicating that we're, we're actually not seeing uh, a lot of growth or we're not expecting much growth to actually happen. However, there was something that really jumped out to me reading this that seemed a bit odd. It says, 
Since the MPC's previous meeting, the ONS, which is Office for National Statistics, had published some estimates of the impact of Blue Book 2023. And it says that the GDP had been revised nearly 2% higher by Q4 2021. Almost uh, all of this news had been accounted for by stronger public sector output. Essentially, what they're saying here is, is that the way in which they're measuring GDP is changing, just kind of coming back to layman's terms. And it always worries me when I see stuff like this because I almost feel like a lot of the time we're being told, it's almost like some smart people in the office somewhere are basically always looking for ways to make the numbers say what the numbers, what they want the numbers to say. So what they're saying here effectively is that the way in which they're calculating GDP um, is, is, has changed and they're, and they're updating and still waiting for the impact of what, of what that's going to look like when they, um, when they do that, kind of look at the impact of the numbers going backwards. But that just, for me, just raises a bit of, you know, slight concern because I'm like, wow, okay. You know, it, it just looks like if you're not paying close attention to this stuff and really doing a lot of digging into this stuff, a lot of the times these numbers are really being presented to you in a way that is telling the story they want to tell us. And this blue book uh, impact essentially is a way in which they're calculating GDP by factoring in uh, the impact of globalization. So they're basically looking at like, um, the UK's supposed economic activity in other parts of the world and trying to factor that, factor that into our GDP numbers. A lot of question marks over that, but, you know, this methodology has been existing for some time, but, you know, um, for me on a personal level, you know, I always, I always question things like this because I always think they're always trying to tell us what they want us to hear. But that aside, GDP... Uh, UK GDP, there isn't really much to say there, 0.1% uh, from a forecast perspective. Looking at unemployment, this one really stood out to me, it said here that the labour force survey uh, unemployment rate had risen to 4.3% in the three months to July, higher than expected in August for the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, uh, their, their, their forecast report. So unemployment rate's gone up to 4.3%. And then he says that the bank's agents have reported that companies, this is a key bit, were expecting to keep staff numbers broadly, st broadly stable with few active plans to make redundancies. However, it says here uh, that the, uh, the, there's another report they look at called the KPMG slash REC reports on jobs. It says it was pointing to a fall in companies hiring new staff. Yeah. Then they went on to say that another, another consideration, a thing called average weekly earnings, AWE, uh, they said annual private sector regular average weekly earnings growth had increased to 8.1% in the three months to July. In short, just summarizing, which might sound a little technical, but just put it in layman's terms, earnings are going up, but there's a higher redundancy rate that's going on. Companies are slowing down in their... Um, in their higher stuff and jobs are not as available as um, as they want. Yeah, just putting it in simple terms. So unemployment rates going up. Again, you need to connect that with GDP and connect that with, oh, do we think the economy is gonna be doing well? Just kind of add up all these bits for us to come to some sort of a, a basic conclusion. Now, I've made the point earlier that inflation, inflation fell uh, to more, to, to buy more than expected to 6.7% with core inflation uh, fall into 6.2%. Here's a bit about inflation, going a bit deeper into it, actually. It says here that services CPI uh, had declined to 6.8% in August, okay? But then they said when you exclude the bits that drove it, things such as, you know, air travel, accommodation, all those bits that usually happen in the summer, when you exclude that, it says excluding those elements, services inflation had been more stable at continued, continued higher rates, yeah? And then if you read further, something else that really stood out as well. It says here that the Bank of England are thinking that the path of services inflation, a key component of the CPI number, was, is likely to be volatile in the coming months, in part reflecting potential noise in the prices of travel-related services. Yeah? So essentially they're expecting that there'll be an uptick in services inflation in January 2024. Um, but they believe it will balance out over time, okay? 
Then it says here, inflation expectations for the year ahead remained elevated. Elevated means that they're still expecting things to be higher than normal, yeah? In particular, it says here that businesses who responded to a survey said that they were expecting their own prices to increase by around 5% over the next 12 months. Businesses are expecting prices to increase by around 5% over the next 12 months. And then they looked at other measures, so measures of household inflation and so on. Uh, they said they were broadly uh, unchanged. They looked at Ipsos surveys and YouGov surveys. Um, and they said, essentially, they're saying here that um, medium-term measures were closer to their historical averages, okay? In short, MPC's August report, their projections, continue to, sh to, to show that the market-implied uh, path for the bank rate, so the, ba the, the base rate, um, that had averaged about 5.5% over the next three years. It, they're expecting to average about 5.5% over the next three years in their forecast period. And they're saying here that the CPI inflation rate is expected to return to 2%, to the 2% target in Q2 of 2025. Just pulling this back for a minute and just reflecting, because there's a lot being said there and a lot to kind of get out of it. It's a lot of you know, ups and downs and comparing to previous periods and comparing back, I thought what would be really useful would be to look at what those four people said. Those four people who voted to try and increase the rate by 0.25%, who got out outvoted. So I went to read exactly what they said. And here's what it says. It says, four members judged that a 0.25% increase in the bank rate to 5.5% was warranted at this meeting. Although there were now signs of weakening economic activity, consumer sentiment appeared to be holding up. Real household incomes had started to rise and forward-looking indicators of output, so economic, economic activity, had remained positive. Then it says, the labor market was still rel relatively tight, consistent with the possible rise in the medium-term equilibrium rates of employment, blah, 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 blah. Then he goes on to say, um, while CPI inflation had fallen by more than expected in the latest data, this, ap this appeared to have been driven by mainly volatile components and had, and had followed recent upside surprises. These members then judged that overall, there was evidence of more persistent inflationary pressures. Although the monetary stance was was weighing increasingly on economic activity, a 0.25% increase in the bank rate, the base rate, at this meeting was necessary, they use that word, was necessary to address the risks of more deeply embedded inflation, persistence, and then to bring inflation back to 2% sustainable target, blah, 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 over the next, over the medium term. I actually think that the fact that the four people in that committee said that is something that we should be, we should not take for granted. Yeah? And as good as it is for us as households that, you know, as good as it is that we haven't, we're not having to think about, you know, interest rate rises at this very moment, I think it's far from concluded that inflation is over, as it were, as a lot of the media seems to be saying, this is the end and blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's the case at all. Okay, now let's speak directly to mortgages. Now, if you go and spend even two minutes on Rightmove or Zoopla, you will see that most properties, if you use one of those Chrome extensions that tells you when prices have been declining, tells you how often uh, a, a property has fallen in, in, in value, you can see that most properties on those platforms are effectively falling in value and have been for some time. So house prices are falling. Uh, and, and private rents, interestingly, have been rising since they started to raise all these rates. So people are worried about their finances naturally. According to UK Finance, about 800,000 borrowers will reach the end of their fixed rates in this second half of 2023, with another 1.6 million people uh, with fixed deals ending in 2024. So this remains a problem. However, I was reading the Financial Times as part of my research um, whilst preparing for this video, they say, and I quote, a number of lenders announced cuts this week, including TSB and Nationwide on Thursday and, and, and NatWest on Wednesday, 
several providers offered new five-year fixed rates below 5%, including Nationwide, Virgin Money, and Yorkshire Building Society. So I went and took, I took a look for myself to kind of, you know, see these numbers and see how they're moving. According to Money Facts, I looked at this before this, before making this video, the average cost of a um, two-year fixed rate was around 6.58%. And I, and I noticed that the best rates, though, were around 5.94%, assuming a 60% loan-to-value. So, although it appears that these mortgage companies are, are reducing rates and competing against each other, basically, uh, to still to try and get business in this type of market, it's worth noting that the best deals are being offered to customers who are effectively first-time buyers, not necessarily people who are remortgaging and trying to get better deals. They're not really offering the best deals to those people. So a big question that would be arising for you right now is likely, should I be fixing for a two-year fixed, or a three-year fixed, or a five-year fixed? And speaking to a number of, uh, a couple of mortgage brokers, you know, in, in the, in the um, today and in the last few days, just kind of talking about this and seeing what might happen and what the Bank of England might do. And based on what I've seen, you know, in terms of rates moving, if I was making that decision, if I was remortgaging, and given the given it's highly unlikely that the base rate is going to be coming down this year, let alone next year, given it's highly unlikely, I would say that a two-year fixed rate, trying to go for that, is um, a bit too short, personally. I personally wouldn't go for a two-year fixed rate. However, I would be tempted by a three-year fixed rate or potentially even a five-year fixed rate if the rates, you know, if the rates are significantly below what we've seen in the last few months. But it'll be a lot safer to lean towards a three-year fixed rate. Overall thoughts. It's worth paying attention to what the governor of the Bank of England said. Mr. Bailey said, when asked, should people, you know, see this as kind of, you know, things are, things are getting better now. He said, and I quote, he says, there is no room for complacency. We need to be sure inflation returns to normal and we continue to take decisions necessary to do just that. Then he played down the chances that rates might come in down soon by saying this further. He said, I can tell you that we have not had any discussion about reducing rates because that will be very, very premature. Our job is to get inflation down. OK. Um, in my personal opinion, it's it's highly likely, given the decision has been made today to keep the base rate at where it is, it's highly likely that the Bank of England will sit on that base rate for some time and see how that plays out. Yeah. To see how that kind of feeds through the economy. So I personally think that in the best case scenario, they will keep rates like that. In the worst case scenario, the declines we've seen in CPI inflation, CPI inflation rates versus core inflation will be reversed by, you know, other elements of the inflation number, such as services inflation and so on. So I'm going to assume that first time buyers and those, you know, the people who are trying to get on a property ladder will continue to be tempted by these various banks, you know, you know, marginally reducing rates, you know, like by 0.2% or whatever. They're dropping them very slightly. So it would appear there would be activity in the marketplace. Uh, and if I was a first time buyer actually speaking to that right now, there's that decision to make on whether is now a good time to buy or not and that kind of stuff. I'd say personally, if you're buying a home or you're buying a home to live in for the long term, then you have, you have, you have uh, negotiating power because a lot of people who are selling right now are pretty, you know, in a way, are desperate to sell because uh, a lot of them are desperate to sell with prices coming down and some people might be holding off. So if you are trying to buy, and if, if I was trying to buy in this market, I would go in hard on a negotiation and, and buy for the long term. And then, then I'll weigh up the, uh, the impact of, you know, fixing a rate at say 3% or 5% or whatever now uh, with, with the benefit I get with being able to predict my future expenses and that kind of stuff. So do I think it's a terrible time to buy if you can afford to buy? 
Now, if you can drive a good bargain, I'd, I'd, I'd get out there and really try to get, get a property that makes sense. Um, but obviously, the decision to keep interest rates flat at the minute, um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next, um, over the next couple of months as we kind of uh, head towards December, uh, which is a typical spending, spending period for people and the new year and that kind of stuff. So um, the next update for, for interest rates will be on the 2nd of November, 2023, uh, where, you know, again, we'll see what the Bank of England decide to do. But overall, I'd say, uh, in summary, this is not a time to really relax. It's a, down, it's a time to be even more vigilant, you know, uh, pay close attention to what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, keep building up your savings buffer if you are doing that. You know, always prepare for the worst. As we enter kind of this winter season, you know, all kinds of things tend to happen. People end up spending more than normal coming up to December and then starting the new year. There's all that emotional up and down that happens. You want to, we, we just want to be prepared for that kind of activity. So uh, today is, is good news. It would appear to be good news. However, it's good news, but. So you just kind of keep an eye on like, you know, what is the protect, what is likely to happen as things unfold. Uh, over the next few months, I'm certainly not. I'm certainly not too excited. I'm. I'm more on the cautious side and kind of observing what's happening, um, and then responding as necessary as things unfold. Okay. Other than that, just want to say thank you for watching today's video. Look after yourselves and your families. All right. Much love.